Welcome back to the Welsh History Podcast. This week, episode 39, The Tyrants of Gildas. This week, as we are about to finally leave the 6th century, let's take a look at some of the key figures who feature in Gildas' lecture. These are the kings of the West, also known as the Tyrants. Before we start that, however, let us look at why he is, ca- he is calling for a biblical apocalypse. If you are religious, or maybe even if you're not, scriptures are often used in ways to apply them to the lives of the people. In some views, this is what is known as proof text. In other words, taking things out of context and putting them into present day. Scholars will suggest that this is taking lines out of context and that it ignores what the original passages refer to to make it fit our situation. Most religious people seek scriptures through multiple lenses and do not see the conflict of using passages out of historical context. In some cases, they argue that this is the point of scripture in the first place. So, understanding that idea, it will help us understand why Gildas wrote the way he did. He was writing both a call to repentance and using history to prove the reason why the current leadership should mend its ways. In his writings, he suggests that he wanted to write this letter ten years previous, but he was inexperienced and his position did not allow for that. Historian Charles Edwards suggests that this is likely because Gildas was not in an ecclesiastical position where he could challenge his superiors. He argues that likely Gildas was not a bishop, priest, or something that high in the church, but was a special type of teacher, and something the early church called a doctor. The position of doctor was a unique one, which allowed you to warn others about their sins based on their academic strength of biblical scholarship. Gildas was considered one of those men. It might also be the reason why people like Bede and Nennius both quote him so liberally in their own documents. Bede was another doctor, so would be in a similar position. Now we will have a look at those he is calling to repentance. Who are they? Where are they? What do we make of their inclusion in Gildas' condemnations of hellfire? Well, how about we start first with Constantine, the tyrannical whelp of the unclean lioness Demonia. And then there's the lion's whelp Aurelius Conius. And then there's Vodopor, who is like the spotted leper, the tyrant of the Dementians. And then there's Kunglas, who is a bear, and the dragon of the island, Magalokun. Constantine, Conus, Vodopor, Kunglas, and Magalokun are, in the view of Gildas, the true reason why Britain was in such a state after the long peace. So who were they? Well, honestly, I'm going to struggle to explain. So why is that? Well, Gildas at times seems to use pseudonyms for their names, which means that the names that we have might not truly be these rulers. Saxons, for example, were not typically named. They were wolves, heathens, villains. They were, in short, those who should not be named. Given that he seems to only mention a few names and a few places, there is a long trail of controversy surrounding them. The name Gildas itself may be a pseudonym, as it was a Frankish-style name not found in Celtic lands, usually. So what do we know? Well, it appears all the kings mentioned were named from the south to the north, starting in Demonia in Cornwall and heading to Gwynedd. It also may be that none of these kings were from the British north. The reason for this may be down to that Gildas was working in the old Britannia Prima region, which was largely Wales in the southwest, it would make sense if they were the ecclesiastical boundaries of the local diocese. Interestingly, each of these men were also compared to animals from the book of Revelations, with the dragging being the worst of them and the head of them. This image from Revelations is seen as a sign of the end of times. In that comparison, Gildas is effectively saying that these kings are Satan's servants, the cause of the end of Britain. Megalacunus, also later known as Megluin, was the British king, or was the king of Gwyneth. Depending on what you think his role may be, he is either the British high king, or the king of the island, or king on the island of Anglesey, the seat of Gwyneth government for many years. 
Gillis called him the dragon of the island, which usually could mean either. The king is considered a good Christian king because he founded many churches, but he might have received Gildas's ire because of what Gildas saw as his serial monogamist, most offensively as someone who sent his nephew to die and then married his widow. Megluin is also known to us having died of the plague in the middle of the 6th century, giving us a way to date Gildas's letter from around the early 540s. So, why were the Western British kings the focus of ire and not the ones closer to the Saxons? Charles Edwards feels that Gildas may have let them off with a mild warning because they were already engaging the enemy while these people were backsliding. I suspect this may come down to the influence of what was the danger for these kings. For the Western British kings, the Irish may be, seem as a much more present threat than the Saxons. Thus, they may not have been concerned for their fellow Brits losing their kingdoms. For Gildas, who looks back at the old Roman Britain with nostalgia and pride, this would have been an unacceptable sacrifice. He would expect these kings to get off their butts and lead the resistance against the wolves, tearing apart the old Roman Britain. Cunniglas may also be known as Cunglasus, or Kinlas in Welsh, which in Latin means tawny hound. He is accused of fighting against his fellow Welshmen rather than the enemy. He is also claimed to have thrown out his wife, in other words, divorce her, and had or at least wanted sexual relations with her sister, whose husband had previously died. This is conceived by Gildas, obviously, as a great sin. It was thought that this king may have been the leader of the sub-kingdom of Ros, which was between the large kingdoms of Gwynedd and Powys. Some suggest that this figure is a proto-Arthur because of the Welsh for bear being Arth. Uh, that's pure speculation. There's no link or obvious link to him. Some claim that Vordapur, the other king, is the same king of Dyfeth called Vordaporus. At the end of the 19th century, a discovery was made of an early king who had an inscription made, which was then found in Camarthen. But, and initially it was linked to this Vordapurus, but the problem is, is that linguists call this into doubt, mostly because this person doesn't have Vor as their first name, it's Vo. And so there's an argument to be had about whether that's true. However, regardless of the skepticism in some scholars, this name is nim similar enough. It could be a relative, and it would place the kingdom firmly in the Irish influence, West Wales. Gildas describes him very old and a widower, and that he had at least one daughter who was called shameless and accused of having incest with Vortiper. The next king is called Aurelius Canius. He may have been a grandchild of Aurelius M. Brosius, who Gildas then unfavorably compared him to. He was acclaimed to be a horrible, have done horrible murders, fornications, and adulteries. He beseeched him to repent of his sins before he ended up like the rest of his family who had died because of the same search for power and lust. While we might know the name of this leader, and we might suspect some other things about him, we really only have his name and where he might have been from. If Gildas was doing his blame game from south to north, it would un be unlikely that he was the king of Paus, as some suspect. He could, however, be a king near Somerset. Finally, we come to Constantine, named for the emperors and ruler of the area around Devon and Cornwall. Gildas says that, despite swearing an oath against deceit and tyranny, Constantine disguised himself in abbot's robes and attacked two royal youths praying before a church altar, killing them and their companions. Gildas, however, notes that he had committed many sins before this incident, and included many adulteries after divorcing his wife. As with others, the, the, he encouraged him to repent. Scholars generally identify Constantine with the figure of Constenin Gorino or Constenin Corino, Constantine of Cornwall, who appeared in the genealogies of the kings of Demonia, which is why we think he's a king of Demonia, even though it's spelt differently. And there is, but there are some who contend that it might actually be that he's from the Demoni, who would have been near Scotland. But when you look at these kings, 
typically every other one literally goes from north to south. So it makes no sense to put him down there. And in all likelihood, he is Demonia, and a king of Demonia. Some other legends claim that Constantine actually repented of his sins, gave up his kingship, becoming a monk, to become somebody known as Saint Constantine. We don't have any clue as to whether or not this is true. This is just what the contention is. And I would certainly not necessarily tend for that option. However, each of these kings, perceived to have faults according to Gildas, still nonetheless seem to be people doing their best in a situation which may not have been easy or as cut and dry as Gildas is making it out to be. And certainly, certainly we have a lot to thank for his noting these people. And while we don't 100% know and understand everything about them, he has given us a good idea of at least some parts of their life, even if he didn't agree with it. And there's some intriguing bits and pieces that we certainly can look at and examine and come to a better understanding of. So we look forward to looking more into these. Hopefully we find more evidence and more ideas as we go through, you know, the archaeology and history. But even if we don't, we at least have some outline specifically about a bunch of kings in a time period that we know so little about. Unfortunately, Gildas did not then carry on and talk about directly to his clergy colleagues, although he called them out in very similar fashion. He was much, much more circumspect over the names of these people. But nonetheless, it's an interesting situation. It's an intriguing circumstance, and it's certainly worth continuing to look into. And there's been a lot of legends and stories that have grown up around some of these characters. Constantine specifically has a ton of different poetry and things that have come up since then. And all of these kings, in some way or fashion, feature in general in the history of Brit the kings of Britain by Geoffrey Monmouth, which, as we've said before, is a very legendary book, but certainly it's interesting to kind of read stories about them. Now, to finish up this week, I wanted to talk a little bit about military conflict in the 5th century. When we look at the military in post-Roman Britain, we need to understand that much of what we have seen is not what is later understood. Saxon cultural practices likely not, were not in place by then. Many of the habits, clothes, and weapons were more likely to be Roman in nature. But Saxons, like their British counterparts, were still a part of the former mechanism and likely understood fighting based on what they had been taught as militia and as parts of the, of the empire. They would learn this both in and out, because obviously as they fought the Romans, they would learn bits and pieces of how to counteract Roman ways of fighting, and sometimes the best way to counteract a way of fighting is to take it on yourself. We see this even with the Romans in the way that they fought with other groups and how they adjusted and changed their military ideals from then until now, or from ancient times to late antiquity. So what we need to know is, is that the Saxons aren't that different. They're not shockingly different. Later cultural practices aside, Saxon culture likely at this point is heavily influenced by the Roman incursions and thus is much more Roman in the way it looks. It's only really later, as more and more Germans move into Britain in the 5th century, that we would be able to notice changes. Likely these come out of larger battles and the creation of the Saxon shield wall, taking precedence over the former fleet-footed Roman-style cavalry units which they had been using. And probably what we've seen is that the factions involved in the fighting for the control of what had been Britannia in the 5th century were probably a fluid mix of Saxon and Romano-British. There wasn't... Let's be clear here. There's no Saxon versus British construct going on. There wasn't like a Saxon army and a British army and they fought at these places and they won wars and they fought battles. The reality is much less clear. We know for a fact that within the Saxon communities there were Romano-British. We know that they intermarried, intermingled, thus the reason why there isn't, you know, largely Saxon genetics in England. Even if there is a percentage, it is still only a smaller percentage than the majority. So we know that the Brits 
within that part of England became a part of the Saxon cultural ideal. I think in some ways that's what Gildas is talking about when he talks about the fact that some went into slavery to their, to their Saxon uh, people is that idea that they actually just took upon themselves the cultural ideas and identity and language of the pagans and became pagan, so thus would be slaves in his view or unworthy in his view. So again, the other problem is too, is that you don't have one concerted British force. The Brits themselves are broken up into, as we've just mentioned, tyrants and different kings and fiefdoms and chiefdoms and as the Saxons were. So they would enter battle amongst themselves. They would fight each other probably as much as they'd fight a Saxon. And we've said this over and over again. Conversely, what we understand of the militia, the military, and all of that shows us that likely they were fighting in a very Roman style. And in a Roman style where there isn't huge amounts of identity based off of uh, the older Roman ways or the newer ways that'll come about later. The Britons, like other provincials, were fully familiar with Saxon, sold with Saxon soldiers, and many probably fought alongside them in some of the late Roman army regiments. That would make perfect sense, considering the amount of Germans that have served in Britain up until this point. This makes it extremely unlikely that there were drastic differences in the fighting styles of the Romano-British and the Saxons. The idea that the Saxons always fought on foot, that they had shield walls, all of this idea is a later development, a later understanding, a later political understanding of the way things were in the 7th, 8th, and 9th centuries, not in this era. In fact, in Denmark, there's a famous bog deposit, and it also covers northern Germany, which shows that these warriors in these regions were entirely familiar with mounted warfare. And it was most likely that across the early medieval west, elite warriors fought on horseback and then only fought on foot as the situation required it. And so your peasant troops, you know, the, the guys with the pikes and the wood pointy things, would be the ones who would be fighting on, on foot and having to slog through the muck. Whereas your, you know, the, the, the knights and the cavalry would be on horseback. And yes, this is not the horseback of an image of a late medieval knight with massive armor and all of that kind of stuff. This is much more rudimentary. But nonetheless, and while there isn't huge evidence for swords in this era, um, we in fact don't find them in a lot of burials, the reason for that could just simply come down to the fact that we are looking at an era where swords may not have been common, but they existed. Likely, they probably got handed down from generation to generation. You know, you inherited your father's sword as a part of your what you got from him as he passed on it may be that they just reused them over and over again until they broke and likely that would make some sense especially if you don't have a ready manufacturer a ready forge to be built somewhere which can re mass produce them then you're reliant upon what what you have much like the money i mean when we look at this era money is reused it does go out of fashion to a degree but we do see that coinage is still in use at this point in time. It's just used differently, and older coins were just reused. And so they became much more worn down, much more turned into slag coins, for lack of a better word, and eventually probably chipped away at, melted down, reused to pay other things, uh, sent around to other, to other ideas, because the, the, the source of the minting had ceased to provide for the British people. So largely silver coins are all that's left and they're all old. And so much like the way the coinage worked, that's probably the way warfare worked. You got old armor, you got the old sword, you went out and fought in grandpa's military gear sort of thing. And this is reasonably understood and can be seen. It, another thing that comes into question is whether or not arrows and bows and arrows were used at this point in time. The thinking is is that yes, they were, but they weren't again as common as as they would be later on that they were a part of the ranged weaponry along with slingstones and javelins which are much more common, easy to make and popular. So, 
at that point in time, they would be the a part of the military, but they wouldn't be a major part. You wouldn't necessarily have a ranged unit of archers in the way that you would have later. Again, you don't have fixed battles the way we think of them in later medieval periods. You know, the, the idea of two gigantic shield walls crashing against each other and trying to break each other probably doesn't happen in this era. We have much more fast-moving, chaotic battles with horses and maybe even chariots, if you want to go back far enough. Just chaos, mostly. So what we're familiar with later on isn't here at this point. The military as we understand it isn't the military that we saw before. And given that battles were fought like this, it may be that there were hundreds of petty kings and tyrants in the era who rose to local prominence but were destroyed before they could reach the Gadothan level of popularity and poetic uh, license. Realistically, we just don't know. The boundaries and understandings of later medieval life are likely not as clear-cut as we see them. And if you think about it from the standpoint of even what Gildas gives us, he's only giving us the western half of the country. He's not giving us kings from the Old North, as they call it, which is basically where uh, the edge of northern England and southern Scotland, where there were still Welsh people. He wasn't giving us a lot in the southwest as well. I mean, he's only giving us the very edge of things. So we don't fully understand what's gone on. We don't have a good, succinct idea of where and when things were happening. And so because of that, we're dealing with what we can. And I know I constantly bang on on this, but we, we do need to understand this. And the reality of it is, when we bring up questions about guys like Arthur and whether he existed or not, there. The fundamental truth is part of the reason why we don't have a full understanding is because we just don't have a clue. That there is evidence and counter evidence and mythology and counter mythology to everything. And so it's hard to say what you can unpick in these circumstances. The fifth and fourth centuries in Britain are very vague in this fact, and the sixth century will continue that vein for a degree because we just don't have even archaeological evidence to give us a lot of understanding. And a lot of that comes out of the fact that there was such a transition going on. It's hard for people looking in the ground to say, this is definitely from the late Roman period, this is definitely from the 5th century, because even dating it becomes difficult because the typical things you use to date things, pottery, coinage, all of that is, is if it's not gone, is old. And is still in use. And so a site which looks and smells a lot like an old Roman site may actually be a early medieval site, but we just can't tell. And so this is some of the difficulty we run into. It's it's like the arguments over when did the Saxons arrive? Well, we know they definitely arrived in the fifth century, but we also believe that they arrived in the fourth century. Thus, it makes it much more difficult to identify when the eastern half of what was then the Roman Britain, British provinces started to turn into more Saxon and Germanic-natured provinces than in the later times. You know, did that happen in the 4th century? Was it something that came out of the 5th century as more and more colonists came? How did that work, and, and what were the boundaries? And, and are the labels that we have given to us by later people even remotely accurate? We can never really know for sure. But hopefully we'll, we'll be able, as we move forward and move much more towards a historical era, be able to identify and talk about things that kind of give us a much better understanding. I mean, I can tell you, for example, that my amount of literature I can use in the Middle and Late Middle Ages goes up by leaps and bounds compared to where we're at at the moment, stuck with Gildas and a few other supplementary sources and then a bunch of secondary stuff. So I look forward to that point, but also it's intimidating because there is that much more sources. There's that much more argument. There's that much more contention about what really went on. So I look forward to continuing to cover this with you. I hope you're having a good day. Please check us out on, uh, on distractionsmedia.com. And for sure, if you could give us a review or a rating on whatever system you're using, like iTunes, for your podcast downloads, it always helps us. It gives us an opportunity for other people to find our podcast. And once again, thank you so much for listening and uh, have a good day. Bye.
This has been a Distractions Media production. For more information, you can check out everything we do at distractionsmedia.com.